Um, hi, everyone. And just um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. I've really enjoyed it thus far, and I anticipate I will continue to do so through tomorrow. Um, now, when, when Paul um, asked that I give this talk, he gave me a very wide remit, and he may regret that. <laughs> He'll find out in the next half hour, because it's, this is a bit of a ramble, so it's a bit bits and pieces of things. Um, they are very broad topics. Fortunately, a lot of the ground has already been covered, because people have been using FMD and bovine TB as exemplars throughout, which is great. Um, now, I'm going to start off, um, well, introductory, sorry, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning, um, some lessons that we learned from the FMD epidemic in Britain. Now, that is not a wildlife uh, slash domesticated livestock disease example, but it is an example of the interaction between policy and disease models um, with some good lessons to be learned, mainly on what not to do rather than what to do um, in various ways. Um, I'm going to say a little bit of what the models can tell us um, and then go on to bovine TB, which is what I spend a fair bit of my time working on now, less so on FMD. And some, if I have time in, in the ramble, I'm going to bring up some, some new science, largely about sequencing, which I've mentioned a few times. Okay. So we're going to start off with a non-disease problem in a way. Um, so Sherlock Holmes, very British example. Um, and this is one of his most famous quotes, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Um, and this is a... a one of the original illustrations from the sign of the four, which is where this comes from. And what people don't, a lot of people, well, some people do know this. Well, maybe, maybe you've heard this before. Um, Sherlock Holmes is believed to have been based on a medical doctor who was a teacher of Arthur Conan Doyle. And so a lot of the techniques that he used for his forensic investigation of crimes come from forensic epidemiology, essentially, for forensic investigation. And so there is a clear link here between the kind of stuff that the veterinary epidemiologists, particularly the ones who work in the field, the way they approach their understanding of the problems. And it's enormously valuable, so I'm not going to say that it isn't at all. It gives great information, has been enormously successful in a lot of cases. OK, and so traditional forensic epidemiology over here. How many of you have watched the program Sherlock? Anybody? It's really good. I mean, I didn't think it would be. I thought, this is the stupidest idea I've heard since, you know, um, an immortal Highlander. Um, but anyway, but that's another matter altogether. Um, <laughs> now, this is, there's a conversation in one of the, the, the most recent series between Sherlock and his elder brother, Mycroft, who is actually supposed to be better at deductive reasoning than Sherlock because he just doesn't have the energy to go out and do anything about it. And they're, they're having this little contest where they're trying to decide who this guy is on the basis of this woolly hat they have. And at one point, Mycroft says this. Um, he, he makes an inference, and he says, balance of probabilities, little brother. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this is actually very unHolmesian. Okay? Sherlock Holmes would never, ever say this, and Mycroft Holmes would never say this in the original books. And the reason why is because it's inductive reasoning. Okay? Probability has nothing to do with deduction. Deduction is all about eliminating everything that doesn't make sense and sticking to what you've got okay? afterwards and saying that is the truth. And it's much more along the lines of mathematical and statistical modeling. Okay, where what you're trying to do is establish broad patterns. Now, obviously, there's an overlap between the two. But what I would suggest is that there's a clash of cultures here, that a culture which is largely based on the inductive reasoning point of view versus one that is largely based on the deductive reasoning point of view can work together and be better than each one individually, but also can end up having um, problems, shall we say. And one of the examples of these problems is the 2001 foot and mouth disease epidemic, where there was an enormous class of cultures between the traditional epidemiologists and the mathematical modelers. Now, I think we've come a long way since that. Okay? We've got people sitting in here in this room talking together before outbreaks about how we can bring these philosophies together. Um, but this is one example where that didn't work. It was a national catastrophe in Britain, cost an estimated 8 billion plus pounds to control. Over 6.5 million livestock were culled. Lots of knock-on effects. I'm not going to go into all the details over here. Um, I'm not going to go into any background with regards to the virus, except to say in this case, the key thing here is the existence of the seven distinct serotypes in the multiple strains, which is one of the problems we have in terms of controlling it, because there is no cross-protection across the different serotypes, and there is only partial cross-protection against the different strains. And certainly in Africa, what you see is wave after wave of FMD um, strains coming through and reinfecting local animals. Okay. 
So um, it's largely a disease of cloven-hipped animals and infects all sorts of domestic and wildlife species. It is highly infectious, as was mentioned before. It's possibly the most infectious uh, virus that we, we know about. It can be transmitted by aerosol transmission, also by direct contact and by fomites. It can survive in the environment for a reasonable length of time. Nobody, as you can imagine, does any experiments on these nowadays. There's some very old Russian results, I think from the 50s or 60s, where they looked at this and saw that under certain conditions that it can survive um, certainly weeks potentially months. Now, whether or not that translates into uh, transmission of infection is another matter, of course. All right. um, it does cause death in young animals in particular, and does cause production loss in older animals. Okay, so the key thing over here is of our three major domesticated livestock species, in terms of the amount of um, virus being produced, pigs produce the most. Okay, so they are the biggest source of aerosol um, for transmission of the disease. On the other hand, cattle breathe in the most air, and they are therefore, in a sense, the most susceptible to it. So there's an interaction, interesting interaction amongst the three species here. Pigs producing the aerosol, as I said, cattle um, being the most susceptible. Sheep neither produce a lot of virus, nor are they particularly susceptible most of the time, although there's an awful lot of variation there. Okay. Um, but they have a particular problem, which is, is that it's often very hard to spot the clinical signs. So as you go about doing your veterinary investigation, sheep can often pass um, undetected. And this was a particular problem in 2001. Okay. So the traditional control policy is um, rapid detection and removal of infected premises. Basically, people go out, they go and look for these premises, they contact trace, and you basically slaughter the animals as quickly as you possibly can. And this was the method that was used in Britain over the, the previous century and very successfully, really, in the end, managed to get rid of the disease. Okay? So uh, very few outbreaks, for example, between 1967 um, and 2001. One outbreak, and that was a an aerosol spread from France, actually, um, from Brittany across to the Isle of Wight. So the emphasis is on veterinary experience, the interaction with the farmers, and the fact that you've got a large cadre of skilled staff to actually do this. Of course, what happened in 2001 was a bunch of things. Um, so disease was introduced here in the north in pigs. It spread to local sheep population via aerosol transmission. Those sheep were brought to a couple of markets. And from one market in particular, there was an enormous spread of disease all around the country. So a much wider dissemination of disease than had really been experienced in a very, very, well, probably ever, actually. We don't have any records of anything remarkably like this. So there's some very definite social network aspects to this, OK? Highly connected individuals and long distance transmission. Um, now, why did we have such a big disaster? Well, first of all, nobody had seen the disease in the country in such a long time. They didn't really know how to recognize it. The state veterinary service was much smaller than it had been in 1967. And the sheep were moving at a very rare time of year. Traditionally, sheep do not move in that time in February, but they're moved at that time largely because of subsidy payments in the EU, or they were at the time. Okay, so a much bigger problem and a huge logistical problem. Okay, so this is another aspect of modeling control, which we haven't talked about so much, but the impact of logistics. How much resource do you have to deploy, and where do you best deploy it? So the course of the epidemic, a very sharp rise over here, and then a very long tail, which is probably related to poor biosecurity. Okay, that's the reason that's usually given for this long tail over here, and a variety of different control policies applied throughout. And the point of showing that is simply to say that if you really want to model this thing in its entirety, all those shifts in control policies can create different effects. Okay? And potentially, potentially, if you want to know that kind of detail, it is a very complex problem. Now, one of the things that came out of this, and this is probably the first time that this happened, was the generation and the use of very large databases, both on the locations of farms and locations of animals, okay? uh, but also the locations of infected premises, and some information about uh, the reason why farms were infected, some information about contact tracing. And so the first time in real time, these databases were used uh, to populate mathematical models. Now, the, the general form, there were three major approaches that were used. One led by Roger Morris in New Zealand um, using a model called Interspread. One with a group that was led by Brian Grenfell, and one with a group um, that was led by Neil Ferguson and Roy Anderson at Imperial College. There were quite different in certain ways, but philosophically, actually, they were remarkably similar. And that's an important point. People often talk about the differences, three different models being used and cross-validating, but the reality is the underlying philosophy of how they work was not that dissimilar. So it's not a surprise, 
okay, that they were giving similar results. Now, the cross-checking is important because it does tell you something about whether you coded it right, for example. All right, so that's quite, it is quite useful that way, but it does not necessarily tell you anything about whether the underlying model structures are flawed. Okay. So this is more or less how they worked. You had uh, estimates of the infections over distance. This is through contact tracing or through the spatial locations of farms. Okay. So you say, well, what is the effect of being a certain distance away from an infected farm in terms of your probability of being infected? And the other thing is a change in infectiousness over time. Again, estimated directly from the data. If you know who infected whom or who ha have a good idea, you can de directly determine both this curve and this curve. Okay, so this is once a farm is infected, how long does it take? How does infectiousness change as you go through some, some nominal series of days? The combination of this plus this gives a probability at any given stage of the infection of a farm that it could infect another farm. And conceptually, okay, you can add in things like the infectiousness of the source farm, which might be dependent on the species and the number of animals or the mix of species, and the susceptibility of the target farm. Okay, again, species, mix of species, numbers. And for every combination of any two farms, you can therefore have a probability at any given time that one would infect the other. And you know, then you effectively, you just simulate it. Okay, you roll dice. Okay, you roll dice. You start off with one infected farm, you determine day by day whether it infects any of the other ones, and you roll that over and over and over again, and that's it. Okay, it's really, really simple. It captures the points about spatial transmission. It captures things about uh, infectious and over time. It captures elements of species, but there's a lot of things it doesn't. So they're actually very, very simple. And the key outcome of those models, okay, and two of them at least um, agreed on this, was that they said, well, if you compare the traditional policy of control, and of course, once you have your model, you can impose different types of control on it. So if you compare the traditional policy, which is contact tracing and slaughter, to one where you simply cull out everything in a circle around an infected farm, this one wins. Okay? And it wins because, um, in theory at least, it could be faster. Okay? And there's also um, some subtler interactions of, between the, the sort of spatial spread of disease and how it spreads. And I know um, Graham was mentioning earlier about the importance of space, and so these models were trying to capture that. Um, and it really had to do with the fact that because there weren't enough vets around, because there were not enough teams around, it was taking an awfully long time to trace those contacts and an awfully long time to slaughter them. So that was the philosophy. And so the really contentious thing, of course, is that it was largely based on this statistical probability. And it was not based on a direct investigation of um, whether or not a farm could have been infected or not, and it had legal, legal implications as well, which is another aspect that we, we need to think about. What is the legal environment that we're sitting in as we go about uh, creating our models and trying to predict things? So if you cull around an infected premises in the first case, there are multiple possible effects to it. The first one is you cull out farms that are already infected, even though they may not have clinical signs, so you get them out early. But you also have the secondary effect is that you're depleting the local population. All right. And so the, the, the theory behind it is that combination of depleting the local population okay, and getting rid of those other infected premises early before they have clinical signs is enough to get rid of the epidemic. Okay. So does it work? Well, here's some basically a statistical analysis of the reproduction number of the disease over time looking across uh, different areas of the country. This is a case reproduction number below one. Now this is of one, sorry. Now this is not the basic reproduction number because it's reproduction number in the context of the existing disease situation. So there's lots of already called out farms in the area. And what, ah, what you see is that it's declining over time. And at the point okay, at which the new policy was put into place, the key new policy of the contiguous call, it goes below one. And this is sometimes um, put forward as proof that the change in policy worked. Now, the thing is, obviously, the reproduction number was going down anyway already, okay, which is pretty straightforward. And if you do a little thought experiment, and this is one of the uses for models, obviously, is you can fit a model of that type Okay, to the epidemic here in Cumbria in the northwest of England and say, well, this is my model of Cumbria. Okay, and these are the simulation results over, I think this was 200 iterations. This is the actual epidemic and you get a reasonable fit. Now, if you double the size of Cumbria, keep everything else the same, okay, but essentially 
double the size of this by adding twice the number of farms you have, and double the area, what you see is it doesn't go away. Okay? It actually keeps rising for a while and then goes down again. Okay? And what that is, it's an indicator that what was happening is not that you were getting this local depletion of susceptibles. It wasn't the fact that you were culling out the ones in the area around you. It's just you were just getting rid of so many farms by doing this that you were getting a global depletion of susceptibles. Okay, so it was operating in a way that um, worked in a sense, but not according to the reasons for which the models were created in the first place. And um, so this is a, a, a very simple model, which, which um, we were looking at quite early on. There have been much more rigorous looks at this, um, particularly by Neil Ferguson's group um, in Imperial College, which have confirmed that in a much more rigorous way. And um, this is a really interesting pair of papers um, looking at um, some of the, the more advanced methodologies that they're using now, which I'll, I'll get back to in a minute. Okay, so the conclusions are, that I would have here, large data sets can be used by simple mathematical models. And it's that combination which I'm particular, am interested in. You know, how do you use these large data sets, not by creating more and more complex models, but how do you explain them using, using simple models, all right? And again, I'm not saying that those complicated models are not useful because they are. Okay. They're very useful for organizing your thoughts, organizing how you think about interactions. But it's a very different kind of challenge to try to model things with simple models. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to get back to this later. This slide was done before I moved some things around, see what it is uh, about molecular data. But the other thing I wanted to point out is, in terms of the preparedness, okay, so this was on a slide earlier, but I didn't mention it. In terms of the preparedness, one of the key issues was that a lot of these things happened on the fly. Okay, so this had never been done before. It's the first time it was really being tried. Um, and the access to the data was done on the fly as the epidemic was going on. Okay. Um, the development of the models was done on the fly. Now, they have since proved to be remarkably robust. And one of the things I would say is they really did have really good, really competent people who, who were developing them at the time. Okay. But there was always an enormous uncertainty at the time because they hadn't been validated. Right. And so I think a lot of the, the prep work that, that needs to be done, obviously, is that these things need to be done, done ahead of time. And they need to be validated ahead of time as much as we possibly can. And you're better off with a tool that you know what it does than you are with something that uses the latest thing. And I think this is where the tension between my scientific self, who really does want to use the newest, latest thing, and what you might do in the event of an outbreak, need to you know, um, reconcile themselves to each other, I guess. Okay, now just to switch diseases, in Britain, FMD was enormously controversial, okay? The, the, the modelers and the vets, um, the rural countryside and, and other people. If anything is more controversial, it's bovine TB. And the role of the badger in particular, because the badger is a, um, an iconic species uh, for the British in terms of being a symbol of wildlife. A, a much loved species. On the one hand, the people who are, are very much uh, pro wildlife versus, largely speaking, the farmers on the other hand, um, and the balance between um, culling this population and controlling the disease and the farms. Okay? So there are issues of persecution of this protected spe uh, species, issues of, of thousands and thousands of cattle being culled, possibly needlessly, because there are issues of why are we doing this? Okay? The zoonotic risk is minimal nowadays with pasteurization of milk. Okay. Um, so there's all sorts of layers to the interaction ranging from the actual disease itself to the interface between the wildlife and the domesticated species to the role of human behavior in the control of the disease, okay, whether it be farmers who are going out and um, illicitly culling badgers anyway okay, to the role of the vets in, in applying the, the tuberculin test, which is highly subjective, all the way through to what you do within the legislative environment in the EU. Okay, and some of these things have been mentioned before. Okay, some background. Again, this has largely been covered. I think the only things to mention here are, one, it's a very slow disease, certainly compared to FMD. It makes contact tracing really difficult. Okay, the duration of infection at the animal level is so long that you don't really have an idea of what are the contacts and, um, that might have caused infection. And this is one of the real challenges in modeling it. Um, you can infect pretty much any mammal, it seems, with TB. I mean, if you give it enough TB, it just seems to infect things, it seems. Um, environmental exposure is important. Um, yeah, okay, so we'll shift on. And as I said, it's very, very complex, okay? So you've got all the factors of different wildlife, possibly the environment being involved, 
the environment being loaded up by cattle and or the wildlife. You've got management and control issues all the way from the individual herd up through the area, up through the entire continent, speaking of the European situation. And you've got possible variabilities, first of all, in terms of the animals, and you get possible variability in terms of the pathogen as well. And all these things are potentially changing over time. And the key underlying question, and the one that which we don't know the answer to despite years and years of study, is how often are badgers giving disease to cattle and how often are cattle giving disease to badgers? Because if we knew that, then that informs all the other aspects of control. Okay? It's the single fundamental question which we do not understand yet. Now this is a, a now fairly old picture of the disease in Britain and mirroring some of the comments we had earlier, you saw through the 50s and 60s a very dramatic decline in incidence in cattle herds. Now this is partially, probably, partially dependent on the subjectivity of the test. And so friends of mine were saying that um, if you were a vet in the mid-80s, then essentially you did a TB test by waving your hand over the herd and declaring it free. Okay, so this very low instance probably isn't as low as it appears here, but it was probably low because at the end of the day you still had slaughterhouse inspection which should have picked up you know, heavily lesioned animals if there were lots of them. Okay, so, so some caveats there nonetheless. And we can look here, not only was there a dramatic increase in terms of the number of animals being identified as positive in the number of herds, but also the size of the area being determined as, as being of high risk. Okay. So a very alarming dramatic increase here between 1998 and 2006. It stops there because very soon after they changed the way they determined the areas of high risk. Now what these are are areas in red um, where animals are under one year testing, in yellow under two year testing, in green under three year testing, and in blue under four year testing. Okay. So another challenge is how do you take those different testing regimes and get an estimate of true prevalence because you've got a rising disease on the one hand over time, changing testing scenarios, changing areas under different testing, and it actually ends up being enormously complex to determine what the true instance is. Okay. One of the key pieces of data underlying an understanding of this comes from what was called the randomized badger culling trial, which was instituted in 1997. Okay, what they did was pro what is possibly the largest field experiment ever tried. Um, they took 10 triplets, they called them. Each color is a different triplet. Um, and they implemented three different, um, well, two controls and two types of disease control and a um, uh, experimental control. So in one of these areas in the triplets, they did nothing. They simply observed what was happening. In one of the triplets, they, they culled as many badgers as they could proactively. And in one of the triplets, they culled out badgers, but only in response to disease on a farm. Okay? Now, one of the interesting things about this is they thought they knew ahead of time what the answer was going to be. Okay? What they thought they had to do was convince people that culling badgers was going to have an effect. And um, they didn't know whether reactive or proactive culling was going to work, but they thought this is going to work. The previous evidence suggested it was. We just need to show it. But um, surprise, surprise, okay, um, the outcomes were quite different from what they thought. First of all, reactive culling, um, as was mentioned, perturbing the, the pig population results in greater movement. Perturbing the badger population also results in greater contact, or at least that's what we believe was happening. But there's a clear relationship between reactive culling and increased incidence of disease in cattle. Okay, so that was the first thing that they weren't expecting. And that occurred both in the reactive areas and in the proactive areas. Okay? In the proactive areas, you had a core area where there was a positive impact, so you reduced disease instance, and around that there was a negative impact. Okay? And the last one, also surprising, and this is um, now um, going back to the FMD epidemic. Um, in 2001, while FMD was on, there was no testing of cattle. All the vets were busy doing something else. As a result, the instance in cattle had a dramatic rise, okay? and they were loading up the environment in some fashion with more, um, more M. bovis. Um, and there was a measurable change in the amount of TB in the badgers. And this is something that they didn't realize before. They didn't realize that cattle were giving TB to badgers at a sufficient rate so there was a measurable impact as a result of one year of no testing. And as a result, okay, as a result, we had a much more complex disease situation than what they thought. And another question here is, this was a pretty big trial. Okay, it was you know, covering a, quite a large area. Each one of these areas was 100 square kilometers, so a 10 by 10 square. So a triplet was 300 square kilometers, and there were 10 of them. 
And in 1998, when they were establishing the trials, they pretty much covered the areas that you would consider to be of high instance. Okay? So these areas in dark gray are all high instance areas. But by the time they were done, in about 2005, the areas had spread so much that now you had a problem with how do you extrapolate from what you knew to all those areas in the fringes. Okay? And that's something which, as you go from statistical modeling, which is largely about interpolation to mathematical modeling, um, you really have to address that extrapolation question. So we have databases. Uh, this has been mentioned before. Um, not only do you know where all the animals are supposed to be, and keeping in mind that, as with any data, these are flawed in various ways. There's lots of problems with it. And if you work, anybody who works with data will know that that's going to be the case. Um, and so you, you, for example, know whether a cow started out in a high-risk area, where they might move to elsewhere in the country. So very explicit information at the individual cow level, plus all the testing results. Okay, this used to be not the case, but now they're recording all the positive and negative test results. And if you want to, you can also get the skin thicknesses that are being recorded, although some people do say that you see a remarkable consistency in the readings that people put down sometimes. Okay, so the tuberculin test is basically a, a, a measurement of the reaction to um, an injection of a, of, a, of a tuberculin. And the measurements they give across the herd tend to be the same, even though the variability is actually quite great because of the um, environmental bacteria, which again is another human factor. Okay, people do not record necessarily what they see. So we have all these information that we can feed into models. Okay. Um, and at the moment where we're at in terms of those models, and I wasn't going to discuss the models explicitly because, um, well, it was more a factor of time than anything else. Um, we have very good models for within herd interactions of TB. Okay, so there's a series of results which look at essentially compartmental models which fit the local data that we have um, for herd outbreaks. And m numerous models agree. We do not have very good models that understand the cattle badger interaction. Okay? So that interaction, because we do not know what the um, rate of transmission is between the two species, um, we have, a, we have a real problem with, with modeling that right now. Um, but it's something that various people are looking at. I'm going to get back to that sort of shortly. What are some new developments? Okay, now, um, so it's been Bayesian inference has been mentioned in various places over here. And one of the big changes over the last few years has been an increased use, both for TB and FMD, actually, of a combination of mathematical models Okay, and Bayesian inference on those models. Now, the important point of this diagram is that the inference is done directly by looking at the relationship between the models and the data. So the traditional way of doing this was you parameterize models. Okay, so you have a set of data. You use statistical models to determine what the parameters are, contact rates, for example, infectious periods, et cetera, et cetera. And then you feed those into the mathematical models. All right, so it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, this approach is more that you actually fit the models directly to the data, okay? using prior information that you might have about what the underlying distributions might be. And in many ways, it's a much more powerful way at looking at that combination, right? because there can be a lot of uncertainty in how you go from parameter estimation to model implementation. The parameters do not necessarily mean what you think they mean in the context of the models, and this get rid, gets rid of that step. The downside of it is it's hard to do. Okay? You can only fit a relatively small number of parameters to a model, and so you're restricted to those relatively simple models. Okay? Um, and so there, there still remains a very important place for the other approach. Okay? Parameterization using traditional regression models implemented in more complicated mathematical models. Okay, so that's one thing. And the other thing I was going to mention is the implementation of uh, models that incorporate sequence data. Okay, so now we can take virus and bacteria, and for a reasonably cheap cost, we can take the whole genome and we can sequence it, and we can track the mutations as they go from place to place. And this is an example of some work that was done by um, Dan Hayden's group, where what they were looking at is a very small foot and mouth disease cluster um, in England, and they were trying to determine whether they could find it with reasonable precision whether any given source premise was a source for any given inf infected premise. And so they developed a combined mathematical model that took into account the genetic information, the information about you had about spatial distances between premises, and the temporal information. So how long is a premise, um, how, how, how far apart are the recorded times of, um, 
identification and estimated all the underlying parameters that into that model, so infectious periods, infection over distance, et cetera. And the end result of that was that it showed a very, very strong relationship between particular infected premises and particular um, source premises. Okay. So a very, very clear relationship that said this is the most likely farm that infected this farm. Now, what this does not do, and you have to be very careful about this, is it does not ask the question whether a completely different model okay, will actually give you the same result. So there's a model consistency here. They're saying, given the model, I can predict this, but it actually doesn't tell us whether it's true or not. Despite that particular problem, um, this is an enormous advance over what you could do before. And there are some other examples where they looked at the 2007 FMD epidemic, where you only had six farms to look at, where again, um, you get very, very good relationships, uh, contact tracing relationships between the two things. Okay. Now, looking at a much higher scale, you can actually look directly at the evolution of the virus or bacteria and use it to infer all sorts of things. And so, for example, this is some data that um, we were given courtesy of um, Suli Rob Osterman, and she very kindly passed this on to us to look at use, using BEAST, an evolutionary analysis package. And uh, Dan O'Brien is also involved somewhat in this. And the idea here is that you look at the location of the individual isolates you get, and you look at the mixing properties in the phylogenetic tree between those different locations. And those locations can be, for example, species, as we have over here. And these represent essentially the amount of transitions between the different species, sorry, in groups, beef versus dairy animals, for example, that you have based on the phylogenetic data you have. So all you're looking at is how much time does this particular lineage spend in one group or the other? Okay. And so you can get estimates directly of the transition rates between them. Now, there's some strong assumptions underlying this, okay, which are quite important, regarding basically you have to believe that the molecular clock is the same across the different groups, or that you have some estimate of the relative um, um, molecular clocks between the two of them. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting new way of looking at this problem by looking at the pathogen itself. And of course, rather than species, you can also look at geographical locations. How much do all these locations across the United States seem to mix with each other? And so you get a direct estimate, again with a number of assumptions underlying it, of the mixing patterns between the different groups. And I'm not saying it gets rid of the need to look at um, trying to find the individual <coughs> cattle movements between the places, but it does give you independent corroboration about whether or not what you see makes any sense or not. Okay, so really amazing stuff. There's a problem, of course, with using those data at the smaller scale, which I want to mention over here. So imagine you have um, M. bovis moving from a cow to a badger to another cow, and each one of these colors represents a different mutation. So you have this original type here, mutates to this type, mutates to this type, mutates to this type. If I collect this one, this one, and this one, I get a very, very clear transmission chain. Okay? I'm saying this guy infected this guy, infected this guy. Okay? The problem is okay, we do not know where the mutations occurred. All right? So over here you get the same blue to orange to yellow to, sorry, blue to red to yellow to orange, the same sequence of events, but if all three of those events occurred over here in this cow, it's equally likely that this cow gave it to this badger and gave it to that cow with, with really important differences in the way you interpret the outcomes. Another factor is that you never sample the bacteria that caused the transmission, right? I mean, you can't. You always pick up the one that didn't move from one animal to the other. And if mutations occur between this one and the one that you take, you can also miss the transmission events. And that's why to get this very detailed forensic look at what's going on, you need to look at the combination of these data with other data. Um, just one last point regarding to this. You can also use the data in the context of what you know about the geography. So this represents the spatial extents of individual clades in Northern Ireland, of Ambovis, showing a very strong spatial structure between how the individual groups of pathogens are being transmitted. And that information is enormously valuable in terms of understanding how things are transmitted. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, these are all the people who are involved in this in various ways, so just say thank you to them very briefly. And I'm going to skip that all because I just wanted to say, well, first of all, this. 
that what we really want to do is bring these two groups together. And obviously this grouping here is one of them. And the other thing I wanted to say is we've got a job going. If somebody wants to analyze all those MBOVA sequences and all those data, um, or you know a postdoc who's interested in doing that, then send them in my direction. Okay. And thanks very much. <laughs>